In the 2016 general election, Donald Trump was clearly shaping up to be the winner of the presidential race. There were already stories of hate crimes around the country as it became clear that the new sheriff in town would enable racism, xenophobia, and all other manner of bigotry. I wrote a long post on Facebook after the election, which has sadly aged all too well. It started out like this, quote, I hope the Democrats do a 2016 election autopsy. Yes, Trump used racism, misogyny, xenophobia, etc. to get elected. But it is only the Southern strategy ratcheted up. Southern strategy has been par for the course for years in the GOP, and it has worked for decades. Not surprised, hate won because hate has been winning for a long time. He was the GOP candidate for a reason. That part is too easy. But the reality is that America sees itself less like a broad middle and more like a collection of groups. Sure, most of us are not perfectly conservative or liberal if we really think about it. But more ideological parties and stronger political discord means that the citizenry has adapted to the new reality in kind. This was decades in the making. And this is the part of why Clinton lost that might be uncomfortable for many Democrats to accept. End quote. Someone I knew from my undergrad campus ministry group that I hadn't seen in years had responded to the post. They said they didn't read past the second sentence and proceeded to tone police my post by telling me to stop labeling Trump's campaign as racist. This was someone who I had kept on my friends list despite this person telling me to my face several years previously when myself and many others from the ministry were graduating that they would miss the non-black graduates more than they would miss me. This was someone that I had considered a friend at the time and a sibling in Christ. And as a fellow evangelical, I thought that keeping this person around was what God wanted me to do, despite their apparent need to say something to me that was deeply hurtful. But in that moment in 2016, when it was clear that this person's personal comfort with the election results was more important than listening to the totality of what I had to say, I was over it. I wasn't going to be disrespected on my page, especially by someone who had no problem with disrespecting me more than once. And so I took back my voice, responded to them that their problem is that they didn't bother to read, and that the Trump campaign was indeed racist. And then I defriended them. In 2020, it's a different story in a sense. Former Vice President Joe Biden has won the presidential election and Senator Kamala Harris will be the first Black American, Asian American, and woman vice president. Strong turnout from Black Americans in cities such as Detroit, Philadelphia, and Atlanta pushed the Democratic Party ticket over the finish line. And this is wonderful news and something that is worth celebrating. Yet the same fault lines that were exposed in 2016 were again apparent in 2020. Most white Americans, men and women alike, supported Donald Trump. And he even gained ground among white women. An estimated 75% of white evangelicals supported Donald Trump. A 6% drop from 2016, but still an overwhelming majority of them were in Trump's corner. We had four years of Donald Trump actively giving comfort and support to white supremacists and domestic terrorists. Four years of Donald Trump splitting up refugee families, caging children, opening them up to be assaulted and abused by Border Patrol. Four years of Donald Trump condemning those who peacefully protested against the murder of unarmed and legally armed civilians by a lawless police state, making NFL protests about himself and treating Black Lives Matter protests as an attempted coup against himself. Four years of Donald Trump tearing down progress made by the Obama administration and destroying protections for LGBTQ plus people 
women, and people of color. Four years of Donald Trump, the authoritarian. And a majority of white Americans didn't see any of this as a deal breaker. I have discussed this at various points during the history of this podcast. The original sin of racism in the United States is what will kill us as a country. Should we not address it in a real way? But in 2020, unlike 2016, there are also a good number of people of all stripes, all colors, all creeds, including white Americans and other non-black people that are waking up to this reality. This time around, I've had the opportunity to view the pages of Friends and get into some great discussions with people who understand all on their own that racism played a significant role, or at the very least, that racism and other forms of bigotry were not issues many voters considered problematic enough to withhold their vote from Donald Trump. This acknowledgement gives me hope. This country is changing, ever slowly, more slowly than many of us would like, but it is changing. And that change is coming, whether that percentage of Trump supporters want it to or not. The question is, will the United States last long enough to see this change bear fruit? I'm your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potster Podcast. Welcome to Potstirer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. I decided to delay this episode a bit to see how everything would begin to play out after the election, which I'm glad I did. Thank you very much for your patience. Also, those of you who joined me for the election night live stream on November 3rd, thank you very much for coming by. It was a fun time. I really enjoyed it. And I plan on doing other live streams every once in a while in the future. Those will be a lot looser than your typical podcast episodes and may include merch giveaways. So be sure to subscribe to the Potster Podcast YouTube channel and hit the bell notification so you can be notified the next time I go live. As of this recording, the election is, for all intents and purposes, over. After securing a hefty lead in the Electoral College, Joe Biden has secured Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia, four out of the five states that took several days to be called, while Donald Trump took North Carolina. This means that Joe Biden is projected to have the number of electoral votes needed to become president come January 20th. Enough and then some. Joe Biden regained not only Pennsylvania, but the other blue wall states of Michigan and Wisconsin, all of which Hillary Clinton lost in 2016. Georgia's votes are being recounted again. But the lead Biden has in votes cast will surely leave that race out of reach for the state's duly elected governor, Brian Kemp, (laughs) and other members of the Georgia GOP to fix in favor of Trump. By the time the electors gather to vote on December 14, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris should end up with 306 electoral votes, a lot more than the 270 that they need to win, and about a 6 million vote difference in a popular vote, enough to say the Democratic ticket won decisively over the Republican ticket of Donald Trump and Mike Pence. Biden-Harris won a majority of the popular vote, But both sides experienced record turnout. Trump-Pence have increased their popular vote total by 10 million and counting. With the way this election has played out, it is crystal clear Democratic challenger Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election over Donald Trump, the current occupier of the White House. And not only that, President-elect Joe Biden will have a mandate. And I'm happy he recognizes this, as he said such in a speech the day before the election was called in his favor by the major media outlets. Joe Biden won. He won by a lot. He got 79 million plus votes, which is the highest of any presidential candidate 
including Barack Obama. Biden got 51% of the vote, and he won the projected electoral vote decisively, 306 to 232. The only reason why it felt like Biden barely won is because of how the votes were distributed and how states count votes. Republicans were more likely to vote in person, while Democrats were more likely to vote by mail. In a number of swing states, including Michigan and Pennsylvania, in-person votes were counted before mail-in ballots. So on November 3rd, these states appeared to be going in Trump's column, and the race looked close. But then, when the mail-in ballots were counted over the next few days, it became clear that, in fact, Biden won those states. Joe Biden won, and he won by a lot. But there has been a mismatch between the unfolding reality for Democrats and the Democratic Party narrative. The blue wave that some Democrats expected didn't extend to Congress. While the Democrats still have control of the House, they lost seats. And while they gained a little bit of ground in the Senate, they didn't take the majority. And folks like Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, and Susan Collins, who had no business being reelected, were unfortunately reelected. The Senate is still an open question, as both of Georgia's Senate seats are set for a runoff on January 5th. If you live in Georgia, make sure you vote in that election. If the Democrats can win both seats, the Senate will be even when it comes to partisanship and with ties being broken by Vice President Kamala Harris, the Senate will lean Democrat. So while it is an uphill battle, it is possible for Biden to have what would effectively be a unified Congress once he's sworn in January 20th. But the Democrats wasted no time going into self-flagellation mode. Right after the polls closed, establishment Democrats began tone policing its more progressive elements blaming them over the party as a whole not winning as much as projected in an election that occurred in the middle of a deadly pandemic and one where there was a distinct difference between partisans in terms of voting method and it was still being sorted out. The ballots were literally being counted still and with each passing day, it became more clear that Joe Biden won the election and that the Senate wasn't all lost, yet the Democratic establishment and Republicans for Biden, Lincoln Project, had their targets set on justice Democrats, other progressives, and those protesting police brutality, those who brought the Democrats to the dance in the first place. The primary gripe was that the Republicans used the calls of Black activists to defund the police, the Black Lives Matter protests, particularly the few that featured violence, and progressive support for universal health care, student loan forgiveness, and the Green New Deal against Democratic candidates in competitive House races. Essentially, centrists are blaming progressives for providing ammunition to the Republican Party. But this argument ignores two key issues. First of all, for over half a century, the Republicans have been masters at setting the agenda, playing offense, and in so doing, goading the Democrats to play on GOP turf. For example, even in the late 1960s, as it became increasingly clear that the United States had no business continuing the war in Vietnam, President Lyndon Johnson continued the war, not because he was a fan of it, but because he was concerned that Republicans would paint Democrats as anti-war doves, and therefore weak when it came to fighting communism. Johnson's war on poverty barely had an opportunity to work before it was systematically dismantled over the next 25 years by successive administrations, mostly Republican. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, government programs were scaled back and even eliminated by mantras like small government and stopping welfare queens, personal responsibility, and ending welfare as we know it. And what did the Democrats do? Instead of playing offense, instead of talking about the programs for their merits, instead of standing by these programs, they started inching to the right. 
Then in the 1990s, we got the third way. Clinton Democrats, who would essentially acquiesce to the GOP narrative and over time took actions that were largely conservative, so they wouldn't be called pinko commies, doves, or soft on crime anymore. The 1994 Crime Bill, the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, NAFTA, heck, fast forward to the Obama administration and President Barack Obama was pushing a health care reform bill that was a scaled up version of the plan touted by the Conservative Heritage Foundation and instituted in Massachusetts by then Governor Mitt Romney, a Republican. As much as we want to talk about how ridiculous it is that a majority of white Americans, many of whom struggled financially under four years of Trump, went to the polls two weeks ago just to go, thank you, sir, may I have another. Decades of effective Republican messaging has a contingent of the Democratic Party doing their bidding while throwing a good chunk of their own base under the bus. As much as centrists demand that progressives market their slogans better or get better messaging, centrists don't bother to market and have seeded messaging to the Republican Party just to try to win back a portion of the electorate that left the Democratic Party between 1964 and 1980 and will not return. They're not coming back, y'all. And that gets to the other key issue with this progressives and Black activists lost the 2020 blue wave narrative. When we look at the Democrats who won their House seats and who lost, progressive candidates won at a much higher rate than moderate candidates. But Jay, of course the squad won re-election. They come from heavily blue districts. If they were in competitive districts, they would lose. We're going to ignore the fact that House Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez originally won her seat in 2018 by toppling a long-serving moderate Democrat and was primaried unsuccessfully in 2020 by moderate challengers. Let's ignore that. Yes, the squad, which includes AOC, as well as Representatives Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, and Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts, won handily in their races. But the squad weren't the only progressives running. Let's talk about the fact that there were a number of other progressive candidates running in House races this year, in addition to the squad. There were 98 co-sponsors of the Green New Deal and 112 co-sponsors of Medicare for All, two proposed policies that are being pushed by progressive members of Congress. Of the 98 who co-sponsored the Green New Deal, only one lost their re-election bid. Of the 112 who supported Medicare for All, all won their races. And while many of these progressive candidates ran in blue districts, some did not. Katie Porter, for example, won re-election in California's 45th Congressional District, a purple district in Southern California. Like AOC, Porter first won her seat in 2018. But unlike AOC, who won a very blue district, Porter was the first Democrat to win the district since it was first formed in 1982. In contrast, almost all the Democratic seats that were lost to the Republican Party were held by moderate candidates. As I have said in other episodes, when GOP light runs against the real GOP, the real thing will win every single time. If you are not providing an actual alternative to more of the same voters will not see any real reason to vote for you. There's also another possible explanation for the underperformance of moderate Democrats in House races. Washington Post columnist Paul Waldman makes the case that what accounts for the loss of seats by Democrats in the House was not progressive messaging scaring off voters in races involving centrist candidates or even that the moderate messaging didn't fit those races. Waltman argues that the losses in these races was due to the presence of the presidential race on the ballot, and that the Democrats' expectation that there would be a 
blue wave this year was unrealistic. Waldman states, quote, Some centrist Democrats in Republican-leaning districts lost. But when you examine the races individually, you see the same story over and over. A member who managed to squeak out a win in a Republican-leaning district in the extraordinary year of 2018, but couldn't hold on in a presidential election when turnout on both sides soared, end quote. In Waltman's view, because presidential elections tend to turn out voters in much higher numbers than midterm elections, the seats held by losing moderate incumbents would have been in grave danger anyway. And then let's talk about Joe Biden's win. Joe Biden is as centrist as they come, and he got the most votes of any candidate in history, even as the GOP was calling him, of all people, socialist. The idea that the Democrats should structure their platform based on worry over Republican framing is insane, especially since, as we can see with the election fallout, much of the Republican messaging is divorced from reality. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if progressive politicians shut up and went along with the moderate agenda because the GOP would just make something up. As Waltman pointed out, most progressives chose to back him, and many actively campaigned on his behalf, despite the fact that he was not who they preferred to be the nominee. So for centrists to turn on progressives is misguided at best. It really is a slap in the face. The other thing about Biden's win is this. He could not ignore Black Americans and Black and progressive activism in his run for president. Black voters were behind Biden's push to Democratic frontrunner in the early primaries, starting with South Carolina, and several civil rights and progressive political organizations led primarily by Black women, pushed voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts in the months leading up to the election. These organizations and the activists representing them were working hard to make up lost ground due to voter purges that Republican leaders in many states engaged in, purges that the U.S. Supreme Court enabled, as well as voter suppression in a number of states. The turnout this year for Biden can be chalked up to these efforts, which succeeded despite voter suppression, not in absence of it. When you look at the states that Biden won this year that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, the majority of those states, including Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Michigan, were pushed over the top for Biden by Black voters in the major cities located in these states. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Milwaukee, and Detroit. But here's the subtext of the blame game. The Democratic establishment is playing against progressives. The problem isn't messaging or marketing. The problem is that there is a divide among Democrats regarding the proposed policies themselves, and arguing over marketing and messaging is a chicken shit way of expressing their opposition to progressive reforms. I've seen a lot of debate on social media about defund the police, one of the more controversial progressive proposals. I discussed police defunding and abolition more in depth in episode 78, Policing Part 2. So if you haven't listened to that episode and you like more context on these proposed policies, definitely check that out. Much of the opposition rhetoric is centered on the terms They're couching it in a way to tone police progressives. Defund the police scares away people you need to support these policies. Find some other wording. But when I ask people who say this, the people who claim the problem is with the wording, when I ask them for a better way to word these policies, they either reply with something like police reform, which is not the same at all as defund the police, or they just say, I can't find a better way to frame it. I just know that framing it as defund the police is bad. Or they won't give an answer, but say, 
why use defund when it means something else? But if you ask defund the police advocates if they really mean defund the police, they'll tell you yes, because that's what it means. You see, this is why activist movements work outside political parties. They are not the arm of political parties, because political parties worry about getting elected and building their power. Activists concern themselves with substantive change, even if it's not popular with the country as a whole. For liberals and centrists opposed to defund the police, or even when opposing other policies that have stronger support nationwide, like universal health care or student loan forgiveness on similar grounds, that it will scare away conservatives or other centrists from voting for Democrats. The argument usually comes down to the idea that because certain progressive proposals are less popular or may not have the buy-in of the Democratic establishment, it's not worth doing. And the more activists discuss them, the harder it is for the party to get buy-in from those who oppose those policies. And this comes down to the fact that the last time the Democratic Party was responsible for substantive changes that were pushed by activists, they lost a major chunk of their base, a portion that over a half century later, they have been unable to get back. And the Democratic Party has yet to fully grasp that they will not get them back. And the best way to build the party back is to lean into the future. The passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, was not simply the brainchild of the Democratic Party. In the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement was in full swing as Black Americans who had lived under the boot of Jim Crow segregation in the South and elsewhere after Reconstruction ended in 1877, had been fighting for their right to live as full-fledged equal citizens with equal rights under the law. Some victories had already occurred by the time the decade began. In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education struck down the long-standing separate but equal doctrine and stated that public schools must be integrated. Also, events such as the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 and 1956 brought the civil rights movement widespread attention. And activists such as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, Rosa Parks, and many others rose to national prominence. Yet going into the 1960s, Black Americans still experienced a very different America. In the South, Black people were kept out of public facilities used by white Americans. Parks, community centers, and swimming pools relegated to using separate public facilities. While 1954's Brown vs. Board of Education was intended to desegregate schools, a companion ruling the next year known as Brown v. Board 2, stated that schools were ordered to integrate, quote, with all deliberate speed, end quote, leading to the process of school desegregation taking well over a decade and a half. And good luck trying to make your voice heard through the vote if you are Black. While the 15th Amendment gave Black people the right to vote on paper, They couldn't really exercise it in the South. Various legal and extra-legal tactics were used by those in power to effectively keep Black Americans from voting. In the North, rampant housing segregation not only kept the races separate, but kept Black people confined to urban slums with substandard housing, public services, and school systems. And in all of the United States, stores, restaurants, bars, banks, amusement parks, hotels, and other places open to the public were permitted to discriminate against patrons as well as in employment. And this occurred all over the country to varying degrees. This meant that no matter where they lived, 
Race was like an albatross across the necks of black Americans that they were forced to consider every waking moment. It affected where they lived, where they worked, what they did for a living, how much they were paid, where their children went to school, what kind of education they would get, where their kids would play, what they could do for fun, and even where they could travel, should they even have time and money to vacation. The Negro Motorist Green Book, also known simply as the Green Book, was an essential guide for black families traveling around the United States, published from 1936 through 1966, helping them find hotels, restaurants, mechanics, gas stations, and other businesses that would serve them, and giving them tips on which cities and towns were safe for them to stay and which ones were sundown towns that they needed to avoid. It's hard for many of us to imagine the need for a guide that would be essential for us to stay safe and alive if we go on a road trip within our own country. But it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, a regular Joe or a famous entertainer or a prominent official or dignitary. If you were black and you were traveling in the United States, this was your reality just over half a century ago. Democrat John F. Kennedy was elected to the presidency in 1960 and assumed office in 1961. In the early part of his term, he was fairly lukewarm on the issue of civil rights. Kennedy's primary concern initially was that any move toward racial integration or civil rights for black Americans would leave him vulnerable to political backlash from the South, which was solidly democratic at the time and was also entrenched in de jure or legal segregation. He was also worried that being more vocal on civil rights meant that he would lose support from his own party for his agenda. Any actions he took, such as securing federal protection for Freedom Riders in 1961 and for James Meredith as the first black man to attend the University of Mississippi in 1962, were couched in legal reasoning, and Kennedy felt that those actions were enough. But increased civil rights demonstrations, including marches, protests, sit-ins, freedom rides, violent reactions from white segregationists to events such as the Birmingham marches in April of 1963, as well as the rise of more militant civil rights figures such as Malcolm X, made it increasingly clear to JFK, as well as his brother, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, that he needed to say and do more. From JFK's perspective, it also didn't help that political rivals, such as Republican New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, were discussing doing more on the issue of civil rights. While Kennedy was still concerned about losing the South, he became even more concerned that he would appear weak and indecisive on an issue that was now exploding on the nightly news across America. So on June 11, 1963, President Kennedy delivered a speech that would come to be known as the Report to the American People on Civil Rights. In part, he said this. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. Nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. Part of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, 
cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if in short he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. We preach freedom around the world, and we mean it. And we cherish our freedom here at home. But are we to say to the world, and much more importantly, to each other, that this is a land of the free, except for the Negroes, that we have no second-class citizens, except Negroes, that we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master race, except with respect to Negroes. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries for equality that no city or state or legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. In this speech, John F. Kennedy discussed the moral imperative in addressing the civil rights issue in a serious way. This speech was also the genesis for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The 1964 Civil Rights Act would be discussed throughout the rest of the year. Talks would continue between Kennedy and leaders of several civil rights organizations, including a meeting held right after the March on Washington in August 1963, where Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Kennedy was also meeting with members of Congress, including House reps and senators from both parties. Keep in mind here that at this point, the major parties were not particularly ideological, and this includes as it relates to civil rights. In the Democratic Party, ideology tended to track with geography. Generally speaking, Southern Democrats, such as South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, tended to be more ideologically conservative and supported racial segregation, while Democrats outside the South tended to be more ideologically moderate to liberal. But Kennedy, who was a Northern Democrat, as well as Northern Democrats in Congress, tended to hesitate on acting on the civil rights issue due to fear of angering Southern Democratic politicians. As for the Republican Party, at the time, the GOP was a pro-business party that included many who were fairly moderate to liberal on the issue of civil rights. But there was a small but rising conservative contingent led by Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater and former Vice President Richard Nixon. The Civil Rights Act would prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It would outlaw segregation in public facilities and public accommodations, ban employment discrimination, prohibit discrimination in federal programs, and would establish the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, which was designed to enforce non-discrimination laws. The Civil Rights Act also banned the unequal application of voter registration requirements, though voting rights would be addressed more substantially in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As far as the Civil Rights Act went, though, the main hang-up among legislators was Title II, which prohibited discrimination in public accommodations, which, for the purpose of the bill, included privately owned businesses that were open to the public. Even some who supported a civil rights bill in general opposed this provision, and a compromise bill had been floated around Congress without Title II, but didn't gain much traction. 
as the bill was being considered in the House of Representatives. A fateful day in late 1963 would change the game. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson would be sworn in shortly after the assassination and would be the president. Not long after assuming the presidency, Johnson would work on the business of getting the Civil Rights Act through Congress. Johnson was a Southern Democrat from Texas who had previously been in the Senate and had been involved in politics for a decade. This meant that he had more experience with getting difficult bills through Congress. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed both chambers of Congress, surviving attempts by Representative Howard W. Smith of Virginia to kill the bill in the House and a Senate filibuster led by West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on July 2, 1964. The vote in Congress was not along party lines, but along regional lines. Regardless of party, Southern House reps and senators voted overwhelmingly against the bill, while a large majority of Congress members outside the South, regardless of party, supported the Civil Rights Act. After the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, President Lyndon Johnson was purported to have said, in reference to the Democratic Party, that due to his push for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, quote, we have lost the South for a generation, end quote. Whether LBJ truly said this, or if this is revisionist history, it touches on lament, perhaps regret, that the Democratic Party has had over the past 50 plus years for the cost the party endured due to the Civil Rights Act and other civil rights legislation passed during Johnson's presidency. Even though legislators in both parties supported the Civil Rights Act, the optics were that essentially these civil rights bills were pushed by a Democratic president over the objections of the solid South. The South felt betrayed. While black voters became a solid voting bloc for Democrats at that point, in large part due to the Civil Rights Act and other civil rights and anti-poverty legislation pushed during LBJ's administration, white conservative Democratic voters, especially in the South, began leaving the party at that point. It was a slow but steady exodus. This is referred to by political scientists and historians as the 1960s dealignment or the Sixth Party System. Throughout the 1970s, the Southern strategy, as well as the work of leaders of what would become the religious right, were able to usher these politically homeless conservatives into the Republican Party. The Civil Rights Act harmed Democrats in future elections as it gave the increasingly conservative GOP ammunition to call Democrats socialist and communist. Labels used historically to oppose civil rights for black people, not only in the United States, but in countries like apartheid South Africa. This also enabled the growth of the conservative wing of the Republican Party to the point that today, there really is no other wing of the Republican Party. Most Democratic establishment notables won't cop to this, but when you look at third way neoliberal politics that has taken over the Democratic Party since the early 1990s. The strategy is to essentially plead with conservative Americans. Those they lost in the 1960s dealignment plead for them to return. These people will not be back, and Democrats need to get over that. Doing the right thing is not always the most popular thing. Say what you want about President Lyndon Johnson, but he realized that in his time. I wish more Democrats would realize this today. Rebranding, marketing, whatever buzzword you want to use for saying that certain plans, from student loan forgiveness to defund the police, 
may be unpopular with the public. Resistance doesn't make them not worth doing. When people's well-being, people's quality of life, and life itself is at stake, let's support real change right now and let time sort it out. And here's the thing. If the Democrats would finally start looking forward instead of backward, they would realize that the way the party coalitions have shifted over the past 56 years benefits them in the long run. The fact is that they are trying to gain a slice of the electorate that is shrinking in proportion to the population as a whole. As I've discussed in previous episodes, by 2045, non-Hispanic white people are projected to be the minority population-wise in the United States. Does that mean that all people of color will support Democrats? No way. Donald Trump won a larger share of black voters than he did in 2016. Still a very small percentage of the black vote, but a gain nevertheless. And Latino voters in Florida were key to him winning that state. But as the GOP increasingly embraces white nationalist, Christian dominionist policies, radical right-wing policies and talking points, there is an opportunity here that the Democrats could seize by pushing against the Overton window and transforming the party into an actual alternative that would advocate for policies that will truly change all people's lives for the better. Some proposals, such as Medicare for All, are already popular with the public. We can start there and work our way through other proposals and ideas, some more popular than others. The Green New Deal, student loan forgiveness, government-funded public higher education, police abolition, universal basic income. I'm sure there's more. As always, Democrats are bad at understanding why they failed to realize the gains they expected. Democrats, the problem is not that your more progressive elements are too leftist. The issue is this. This country is changing. This country is diversifying. And while you are well positioned to benefit from that, and you are starting to benefit from that with the election of Joe Biden by the largest popular vote total in history, you are still fighting to get back people you began to lose 50 plus years ago and aren't coming back. Instead of trying to capture a population whose share is shrinking, work harder at gaining and delivering on those who might be more open to hearing a message of real, substantive change. And for goodness sakes, stop screwing over the people who brought you to the dance. We are now in the last two months of Donald Trump's regime, and he is behaving much like a convict holding onto the fridge, the couch, the walls, as SWAT carries him out, rips him out of his home and into a waiting police car. He doesn't want to leave, and he has been doing everything in his power to stay. The presidential election elicited extremely high participation by American standards, setting records for the number of votes both major party candidates received. This was as close to a free and fair election as we were going to get when taking into consideration the voter suppression efforts of state Republicans in a number of states, such as registration purges and the gumming up the works by Trumpist postmaster Louis DeJoy. If the United States Postal Service wasn't tampered with, resulting in some votes not making it by state deadlines, can you imagine what the election would have looked like? But even under those circumstances, the efforts of countless individuals and organizations working hard to make up that lost ground has meant that while Donald Trump was wildly successful in bringing out his supporters, Joe Biden was even more successful in bringing out his. A coalition of those who are truly on board with Biden and those who may not have seen Biden as their preferred candidate, yet recognize the terror of Trump's regime and simply want it to end. Joe Biden won the election, decisively, fair and square. 
But as of this recording, Donald Trump has yet to concede. Far from it. Donald Trump, like an egotistical brat playing Monopoly with his annoyed friends, refuses to admit publicly that he has been soundly beaten by Joe Biden. And most Republican officials, both within Trump's White House and in Congress, have gone along with Trump, refusing to acknowledge the reality of what has happened. While Joe Biden is the apparent winner by the measures we typically use to declare winners of presidential elections, and has been for the past two weeks, up until November 23rd, Emily Murphy, Trumpist and administrator for the General Service Administration, had refused to sign off on the presidential transition, which meant that the incoming Biden administration didn't have access to the contacts or resources typically provided to presidents-elect at this stage in the game, and had to self-fund the beginning of the transition. As was shown after the September 11th attacks, the late transition between the Clinton administration and the George W. Bush administration in 2000 is cited as one of the factors that led to the attacks in 2001. So this is a national security issue. Trump has decried voter fraud, and though he and his representatives, such as Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and Jenna Ellis, have claimed to have all kinds of evidence. What has been circulating on social media so far have been misattributed videos and unsubstantiated statements. Trump and GOP lawyers have launched lawsuits in several swing states attempting to throw out votes, with the desired remedy being that Trump is declared the victor in each of these states. Yet of the more than two dozen cases at this point, only one so far has been successful, and that was to move poll watchers in Philadelphia from 10 feet away from vote counters to 6 feet away. The evidence that Giuliani and company have claimed exists hasn't made it to a court of law, and these suits are being thrown out, not only thrown out, but laughed out of court. And while they can appeal, the goal apparently is to make it to the U.S. Supreme Court, where Trump expects a 63 conservative majority to gift him the presidency. The way some of these cases are being dismissed, specifically the ones dismissed with prejudice, they cannot introduce new evidence in these appeals. And in additional attempts to end run the election results, Trump and his cronies, such as Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, have targeted geographic locations in swing states with significant Black populations, such as Detroit, Atlanta, and Philadelphia. They have reached out to state and local officials there in efforts to push Republican legislatures to ignore the election results due to purported fraud in Democratic Black cities and what they call illegal votes, (coughs) Black votes. (coughs) And on that basis, send their own slate of electors to the meeting of electors to vote for Trump on December 14th. Let me give you an example of what this has looked like. In Wayne County, Michigan, home of Detroit, the county's election canvasser board initially deadlocked last Tuesday, November 17th, in what is typically just a simple procedural vote to certify the election. The Republican canvassers, Monica Palmer and William Hartman, initially refused to certify the election in Wayne County because 70% of Detroit's absentee counting boards were out of bound. In other words, there was a discrepancy found in the absentee ballot between the names recorded and the number of ballots. During the public meeting held Tuesday night, Palmer said when pressed that she would be willing to certify to vote in other parts of Wayne County, just not Detroit. While the discrepancy sounds on its face to be a major issue, there are a few things to consider. When we talk about out-of-balance counting boards, we're generally talking about procedural discrepancies, such as names being mistyped when entered into the system, or an error in scanning, stuff like that. About 878,000 votes were cast in the county, including 250,000 votes in the city of Detroit. Out of 878, thousand Wayne County votes and those quarter million votes in Detroit, the number of votes that are at issue, 357. 
Joe Biden leads Donald Trump in Michigan by 146,000 votes. So even if those 357 votes are thrown out, it won't impact the election. The other thing is Detroit was not the only Wayne County community with absentee counting boards out of balance. Livonia, a 92% white suburb neighboring 83% black Detroit, had a higher percentage of absentee counting boards out of balance. Yet Palmer and Hartman had no issue with that. But perhaps this is what they were looking to do. If they could give some reason, even a garbage reason, to refuse certification of all ballots in Detroit, that would make a huge difference. 233,000, or 93%, of those quarter million Detroit votes went for Biden. Throwing out all the Detroit votes would swing the election in Donald Trump's favor. After three hours, where community leaders, poll workers, clerks, and voters verbally ripped them a new one, and they were excoriated on social media, Hartman and Palmer decided to certify the election. Their caveat was that the Secretary of State's office review these discrepancies in Detroit, which they already kind of do after statewide certification. After the Republican canvassers signed on a dotted line to certify Wayne County, Monica Palmer got a call from Donald Trump. After that call, she and Hartman sent affidavits expressing that they wanted to rescind their certification because they claimed they voted for certification based on bullying and harassment by the right and the left. And Palmer even claimed that she was being harassed by Gross Point Antifa. As you may know, I'm originally from Detroit. I grew up five blocks from one of the five communities that make up the Gross Points. The Gross Points include the richest locale in the state of Michigan, which is Gross Point Shores. If you're not from Michigan, imagine for a moment. Just imagine here. Beverly Hills Antifa or the Hamptons Antifa. Monica Palmer is trolling. Fortunately for Detroit, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson says there's no way the canvassers can rescind their certifications. And Michigan ended up certifying the election on November 23rd. Donald Trump also failed in his series of lawsuits in Michigan. But at the same time, he wasn't done trying to strong-arm Michigan Republicans into delivering the state for him. He sent for GOP leaders in Michigan's legislature, and they went to Washington to meet with him. They say they will follow the law as it relates to the election. And generally speaking, most state Republicans involved in elections have been deferring to the popular vote in their states. But it is extremely disturbing that the current occupier of the White House is openly trying to manipulate the results of his own election. This is an attempted coup in plain sight. The president is trying desperately to force the overturning of the results of a free and fair election an election where he decisively lost so he can remain in office. We would do well as a country to appreciate the seriousness of this. There are some who are saying that, no, this isn't a coup. It's a grift. Donald Trump's official election defense fund is taking donations, purportedly to fund this effort to deliver the next presidential term to him. But according to the fine print, If you make a donation of $8,000 or less, that money is not being used for legal challenges, but instead will be used to settle campaign debt. It's been made abundantly clear that Donald Trump takes advantage of his own supporters, including bringing them into arenas, into close quarters, and exposing them to a deadly virus, COVID-19, in order to stroke his own ego, then stranding them because he didn't pay for the shuttle buses that would take them to their cars, which apparently happened three times in the run-up to the election. So misrepresenting his fund in order to take care of his debts would be par for the course. Grift? Yes. But a grift does not preclude a coup. All laws, including the U.S. Constitution, are only as powerful as the will to enforce them. 
We can talk all day about the shattering of norms and that the United States Constitution outlines deadlines for transition of power and that this is what should happen. But Donald Trump has been violating a number of norms, regulations, and laws over the past four years, and it hasn't made any difference. The House tried to hold him accountable through impeachment, but earlier this year, before the pandemic was in full swing, can you believe it's been that long ago? Senate Republicans decided that the president is above accountability. Everything that has happened over the past several months is on their heads as well as Donald Trump's. As long as those who have the power to enforce these laws are ignoring them, pretending they don't exist, as they have over the past four years, none of these norms, laws, what should happen, none of that matters. Now, I'm sure you're wondering this. Do I think the coup will succeed? Probably not. Donald Trump is bad at this. His regime has been run like his businesses. Get rid of people who won't do what Dear Leader wants. Get people in who are willing to do so. Even in the last days of his term, Donald Trump has replaced the Department of Defense higher-ups with yes-men. He has also fired his top election official, Christopher Krebs, for essentially contradicting him by debunking the election corruption and fraud claims spewed by the regime. It's disturbing. But it also mirrors the fact that he's bad at keeping people who are good at their jobs, and instead values people who will coddle and stroke his ego. Remember, Donald Trump is a bad businessman. His $400 million in debt and several bankruptcies under his belt speak for themselves. He's not executing this whole coup thing well. Here's the other thing. We have seen huge numbers of people in the streets this year considering the pandemic, particularly due to the Black Lives Matter protests. If you overturn the will of 80 million Americans who made the effort to vote in this election, some of whom risk their health to stand in line during a pandemic in order to vote Donald Trump out of office, this could get really, really ugly. And this could be dangerous for those staging this coup and enabling this to happen. But the real concern here with an attempted coup right now is that this could make it easier for an authoritarian coup to be successful sometime over the next few years. Of the nearly 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump in the 2020 general election, a good percentage of them are still under the impression that Donald Trump won, that Joe Biden stole the presidency from them, these Democrat cities full of corruption and thugs and lawlessness ripped victory from their grasp, that illegal votes from the wrong people overwhelmed the legal votes from the right people after election night that they should have kept counting the votes in Arizona and Georgia and stopped counting the votes in Michigan and Pennsylvania. These are people who got so upset at the reality of a free and fair election where Joe Biden won that they turned against Fox News for being that stop clock that's right twice a day and decided to tune into straight-up propaganda farms like Newsmax and OANN that make Fox look like the Young Turks. And those are Americans who are primed for a leader down the road that can mobilize them. The right person, someone who can speak to the same grievances, fears, and prejudices as Trump did, but is smarter at organization and insider politics, could make a coup happen more effectively. Given how many GOP officials, some of whom have been in politics for decades, have gone along with the Trump delusion instead of supporting the democratic process, it stands to reason that someone smarter and more effective than Donald Trump could get their buy-in. This is why it's important to be vigilant. Even after Joe Biden is sworn in as the new president of the United States on January 20th, 2021. And after that point, to finally hold Donald Trump and those who enabled him accountable. 
conservative commentator and former George W. Bush speechwriter David Frum said this, quote, Maybe you do not much care about the future of the Republican Party. You should. Conservatives will always be with us. If conservatives become convinced that they cannot win democratically, they will not abandon conservatism. They will reject democracy, end quote. While Frum's point was that we needed to support a more compassionate, reasonable Republican Party, the devil is in the details. We are living with a contingent of this country, 40%, perhaps more, that see democracy as disposable should they not get their way through free and fair elections. People who have shown their support for domestic terrorists and are willing to raise $2 million dollars for his bail and for his defense. People who would support a coup if they can't win at the ballot box. This, my friends, is extremism. Thank you very much for listening to Potstir Podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime, or on your favorite podcast app. Go to potstirpodcast.com slash download and you'll see the links. Subscribing gets you new episodes once they come out, so you don't have to wait. If you enjoy the podcast, please give it five stars and leave a review. And I'm always on Twitter, so follow me there at PotstirrCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future, because freedom is not free.